few minutes I have, I'd like to uh, basically fulfill my task, which is a sort of an assessment, a um, analytical, historical assessment of where we are on this 9-11 uh, from where we began, or actually from where they, i.e. the jihadists, began on 9-11-2001. I do not pretend having all the answers. I just would like to draw a historic, historical uh, lineage of the forces implicated. And to do so, I'd like to use the Air Force technique of flying really a, at a very high altitude, meaning looking at it from a strategic perspective, which is going to miss oceans of details, but which may give us some sort of a general picture uh, of uh, post-9-11 warfare and conflict. On that day, eight years ago and afterwards, um, Washington and the country were divided on, on two things and continue to be. And I think that is the problem. And unlike in World War II, or even in World War I, when the conflict began, clarity was uh, not to be discussed. I mean, Britain and its allies, and uh, you know, others in the France realized who they were fighting, and realized what is the last target, so that the conflict will end. That is not the case in this conflict. And I'm sure in all your works, and most of you are engaged in the world of ideas, you realize that one major problem we're having in America, and certainly in Europe, in Brussels and beyond, is the fact that we're not agreeing on who attacked us, who is leading an offensive against America and other democracies, and what to do about it, how to wage an action back. We are still incredibly, as a historian I would say, it would be incredible in the future, for future historians, to come back and visit 09 and realize that eight years into the conflict, uh, we're not sure as to the identity of the threat. Eight years by World War II measurement, five years, you know, we have already won that war and we've been to Berlin and we've been already engaged in the next one, the Cold War. We are at the eighth year, and yet we have uh, top advisors in the administration suggesting that jihad is yoga. That is incredible. Yes, we smile. And when I discuss it with my students, we, of course, the younger generation writing serious papers based on serious linguistic knowledge, you know, don't buy that. But we are concerned because that is not a talk on TV show. That is basically the talk of the new approach to the national security perception, which will have consequences, of course, in the fact of how we are going to be responding to the threat. So let me go back quickly to the debate of 9-11 and bring it to, uh, to today. The perception of by whom we were attacked, the divide is very simple. You have those who claim that it is Al-Qaeda, which is true. It is only Al-Qaeda and few of its uh, quote-unquote extremist allies, which could be stretched uh, God knows how, how big. But added to it, the arguments are, if those forces have attacked us, it's most likely because of our policy. It's because of U.S. foreign policy. We've, we've heard those arguments, and we continue to hear them today. While the other school as of 01, argued that it is Al-Qaeda, but it is also a huge nebulous of jihadist forces. Al-Qaeda is only a mutant form of these jihadist forces, only a stage in the history of the, the jihadists. And it's not only jihadists at large. It is of two families, the Salafists, whom we are encountering across the world, it happened that the force that attacked us on 9-11-2001 was Salafist, is Al-Qaeda, but it also happened that the force that attacked us in 1983 in Beirut was Khomeinists, jihadi Khomeinists, and continued to be mobilizing against us. That's from an academic perspective. So because we had that debate about is it that large network or is it only a group? Is it because of 
the ideology of that network that relentlessly continues with offensive, strategic offensives against us, regardless of our foreign policy, or is it because of our foreign policy we had that weakness in responding strategically? We had many hesitations over the past um, eight years. So the response was that in, 19, in 2001, we went as a government, Congress and administration, with the support of the public, at the time against the big network idea. The big network idea meaning we went in the field on the ground, as the colonel mentioned, in the battlefield of Afghanistan, crumbled one regime. That was, as it is said today, a choice of necessity, true. But then we went also into Iraq, much debated. That was not a choice of necessity, I agree, but that was a project. That was a project to respond to the bigger picture, to the bigger channel. And the result of the management of that project could have been and should have been the answer to why we did Iraq and why we did what we have done all these years. Now, the forces that countered our action since we began in 2001 till about 2006, we're not just Al-Qaeda. We were not only fighting Al-Qaeda and the Sunni Triangle. We were fighting all the other types of Al-Qaeda and they were widening. We're fighting the whole Taliban. Not only the Taliban of Afghanistan, then the Taliban of Pakistan. And then came all the other mutant jihadists who engaged in other battlefields. It was widening. In the same way World War I, began in Sarajevo and it widened across the continent, World War II as well. It's almost like a classical confrontation with non-classical means to the Shabab al-Mujahideen in Somalia, uh, to the other forms of uh, Al-Qaeda entities in the Sahel, to uh, Pakistan, Indonesia, all the way to the Philippines, other countries not involved in our efforts, such as the Russians, for example, got hit as well. They were critical of our efforts, and yet they got hit by the same network until very recently. The British were hit, the Spaniards were hit, so on and so forth. So, how would I divide the history of this war on terror, which I, in my books, coin as a jihadi war on democracies? Because the jihadi war on democracies continues. We may choose to engage, and as is the case today, we have chosen to disengage. But the jihadists are not disengaging. They cannot and will not. They can cease fire. They can go front burner, back burner. One stream can engage us. The other one is preparing the weapons, the bomb, Iran. Then the other stream will engage us, and the other one will retreat. I mean, people with military studies understand that that's how global conflicts function. So if I want to divide the last eight years, I'd say for seven years we were engaging them. In the last year, I'm making the case that we are on a retreat, on a general retreat. This is not political talk in the media. This is academic talk. We have decided to disengage. And I'm not having a value judgment because maybe if most citizens with the knowledge they have, with what was explained to them, believe it's more rational to disengage, maybe this could be a choice. But at least citizens need to understand that we are in an era of disengagement. That's where clarity is necessary. So in those seven years of engagement, there is another subdivision. We had two years of being on the offensive, 01 till 03, crumbling the Taliban, crumbling Saddam Hussein. But we had five years of stalemate, what we could compare to trenches war around the world. We have not really actually made thrusts, to be very clear about it historically. And there are reasons for that. The reasons is that, are that in Afghanistan, we clearly won the first round. Taliban regime is down. And that's not something easy. That's not something light. A jihadist regime was down in the post-Soviet era. The problem was, next stage, 
what had to be done afterwards. And the afterwards is a war of ideas. And it's not what uh, Frank and I used to be, you know, critical of, such as the strategic communication swaying heart and mind. It is not about public relation operation. It is about inducing, supporting our real allies within the civil societies so that they will take the fight ideologically in every village, in every city of Afghanistan, in every other battlefield. But where was the problem? The problem was we had to induce, we had to initiate, we had the money and we had the logistics. What we didn't have was the political will. The strategic will to engage in an ideological warfare because if you want to do so, you've got to name an enemy ideology. You cannot wage a war of ideas if there is no enemy, ideological enemy or foe. When several times the past administration on the top delivered great speeches compared with what was before. If you recall between 01 and 06, great speeches. You know, the top cannot do all the battle. I contend that the bureaucracy did not follow through. The bureaucracy of the Bush administration at some levels did not follow through. And I contend as well that the forces the United States were facing in the war of ideas are much bigger than the forces we have been confronting in Afghanistan and in Iraq and elsewhere combined in the war on terror. And that may be a surprise to many. In the war of ideas, we are confronting immense powerful lobbies that are feeding from oil producing regimes. And to be very clear, there is a hardcore in OPEC which links up with a hardcore in the OIC, Organization of Islamic Conference, which is not obviously fighting us in Afghanistan and Iraq, Al-Qaeda is. But what they're doing, they are the second line. Once we touch the ideology, they will mobilize everything they've got to stop us. They would allow us to fight Al-Qaeda. That's why they must be very happy now. We're going to crush Al-Qaeda if we can. But the real factory that produces the Al-Qaeda jihadists, that we cannot touch. It's a no-go. And we, the fighters in the war of ideas in this country, have been back and forth asking ourselves, what's going on? We were in a war against the terrorists, but every time we were about to identify the jihadist Salafist or the jihadist Khomeini's ideology as a threat to our national security here, or to those societies where we were seeking to find alliances, there was a blockage here in Washington, D.C., and there in Brussels. That's what transformed the war, in my sense. From the first two years of being on the offensive to the following five years of being in the trenches in a stalemate, what stopped the second stage from fulfilling itself, meaning from moving these civil societies from the stages of being penetrated by the jihadists across the board to consolidating forces of democracy working with women and NGOs and minorities was the fact that we were not allowed to touch the ideological level. Because if we have done so, let me take it to the end of the analytical uh, mechanism here. Touching the ideology which feeds Al-Qaeda, Hezbollah, Jama'a Islamiya, Taliban, is basically touching the same ideology that the oil producer regimes have been propagating for many decades. And it means as well that if we project democracy in the region, we basically are threatening their interests. So here let me bring it to end. Two years of offensive, five years of stalemate, and this year is the year of the general retreat. We have to admit that. We are disengaging from Iraq without containing Iran. We are not meddling in supporting democracy, and I use that term on purpose, in Iran. We are talking to, Hafez, uh, to uh, uh, Bashar al-Assad. We may be talking, may be talking to Hezbollah. And in Afghanistan, despite the pushes which are now under study, we are seeking to find the good Taliban to engage them. This is going to take some time. 
until we realize, or the American public will realize, the legislators will realize, and hopefully, before it's too late, the administration would realize that the jihadists are still at war, even if we stop the war. Thank you very much for having me here. <clears throat>